And uh, Vishwanath, it's also a creation. I mean, I'm, the models are not going to be give one acre of land and yeah. water, for example. It's, it's opening up a basket of rights, right? I mean, you're not talking only of you. You want to get rural populations also into diverse kinds of employments in which the security is much higher. So you're not only talking about allocate one acre and this minimal water. But for example, what is happening today, uh, a study that I want to share is this uh, command area of a large irrigation project where uh, because of this whole uh, surface and groundwater uh, nexus where uh, large amounts of surface water is actually being uh, siphoned off through the ground uh, by a certain concentrated uh, group of people who are certainly who belong to a certain caste group, who belong to a certain class group. And uh, what has happened as a result is that uh, the farmers who are in the command area without ownership of wells are actually thrown out of the system, thrown out in the sense that they are forced to actually sell their lands because they simply cannot be part of this system in which you have uh, certain people actually garnering resources to use that public resource. So, First of all, it's a critique on how your public systems function and uh, you know how uh, privatization of that public resource itself is taking place. But people are actually, uh, re people are being eroded off or dispossessed of that resource, that, that small resource that they had. And in fact, you have to have a program which talks about how not only resource access improves, but also how uh, this resource access can convert into a meaningful uh, livelihood and beyond uh, kind of a right. So I think we cannot, we cannot say that these are stunting. These are what we call as, you know, uh, baseline sort of uh, uh, demands that we need to art articulate in the rural context. In the urban, it might be a different scenario. But you also need to look at the urban-rural transitions and articulate your demands uh, accordingly, I think. So I, I would say, I mean, just a comment on the earlier discussion on uh, how uh, this whole understanding of how markets and how uh, when capital actually takes over, how these divides of caste and patriarchy just dissolve. You know, that was a very classic argument of uh, how capitalism is actually going to break all these barriers and it's simply going to be class that is going to uh, uh, sort of, uh, yeah, exist and uh, patriarchy and all of that is going to uh, just wither away. So, in this case, in fact, we have so many examples on the example that he gave of uh, not only class 4, but waste pickers. Hmm? So how actually capital also structures itself around the existing inequities. So why certain castes are picked up, even if it is a private uh, enterprise which is managing solid waste, why would only certain castes be picked up to uh, handle waste, for example. So ideally that whole private enterprise should have opened it up and if it's better paid, it should be open to all. So why does that not happen? So how social structures themselves become tools to uh, actually further uh, the cause of capital is, is something that we need to understand because that's uh, also one strand of this whole Chandrabhan Prasad's Dalit agenda which talks about markets are going to free us, you know, Dalits don't want the left agenda. So there's never going to be a meeting of the left and the Dalit uh, agendas. So there are those strands of thought, but I think we need to understand how these, uh, how patriarchy is used. So how women's roles, their expectations are actually used to further uh, a particular kind of an interest. So that entire civil society movements, I mean, all of that has also contributed significantly to debates that have come up. I mean, what you said, gender, I mean, it was not as much a discussed in the water sector, okay? I mean, <coughs> feminism has been there for as long as <laughs> exploitation and subordination. So uh, it's definitely been on the agenda. But when you make an analysis of this kind, a pre and post 90s, uh, the only point I would like to make here without taking, uh, making a very strong opinion on either is that this analysis definitely has to look at the broader context, the struggles that took place before, after, the role of the state that has changed and how even markets, in fact, uh, or the private sector has actually used some of these uh, groups or the social disadvantage or the historical disadvantages to its benefit. Hmm? So if you look at the whole Chhattisgarh, for example, the entire tribal belt, hmm? uh, it's, it's, it's a sort of uh, an area where 
all the natural resources. I mean, I think Shripad would be able to talk about it in terms of how uh, how certain communities then become the dispossessed communities. So why is it so? You know, why are certain communities dispossessed? So these are questions that we need to be asking to make a critical analysis of the pre and post at one level where you are also looking at what kind of civil society movements, what kind of issues were taken up when the state played a sort of welfare role and in this new kind of a scenario, what other movements demanding or what kind of civil society demand is getting articulated which also has a significant role to play in what brings visibility to different issues. But what we definitely can say, I mean, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples in terms of this whole question of pricing and cost recovery in uh, one of the KFW <coughs> uh, projects. This was a minor irrigation project which uh, aimed at a full cost recovery of the conveyance system. This was the distribution system. Uh, the main uh, cost of actually building the dam was uh, part of the uh, project, but uh, the conveyance, the entire a canal in one of the villages, this was a closed pipeline in Pune district. Uh, the recovery of the conveyance system had to be entirely borne by the uh, users. So that was that was what the uh, scheme was all about. Uh, ONM of course uh, was very clearly, uh, I mean what the charges would be paid for maintenance of the system. But uh, what we saw in one of the villages which we did uh, a study uh, was, that much of the uh, cost recovery, a part of that cost recovery, it was something like 40% had to be in the form of labor and 60% actually had to be in the form of cash. So there were uh, very well made arrangements of tying up with banks, so KFW was going to tie them up with the local, whether it was State Bank of India, Bank of India, uh, to get the loan and repay that on terms uh, set by them. But 40% of the labor was to uh, was part of the Shramadan. So that was the arrangement. And what we saw in this particular village was that most of the strenuous labor actually came from women, which was digging the trench. So there was little that was mechanized and much of this labor actually was not done by men because that's Shramadan, right? I mean, that's free labor. I'd rather go out on construction sites and uh, bring in more money to serve my needs of whatever. So it was very clear, it, it was a very sort of revealing example for us in terms of how cost recovery was actually playing out in terms of women's uh, labor and increasing the uh, sweat labor that women provided towards the cost recovery of this particular project. So this was, this was in fact called as the Participatory Irrigation Development and Management Project. It was the PIDM model that was being worked out. I'm not sure if it was across the country, but in Maharashtra there were some six or seven projects, na, I think, which KFW was supporting. And uh, only one because there was a very good Kharse's uh, place where they actually had a very good mobilization and the community, it was largely a tribal uh, location and the community contributed towards sweat labor. Most of the other projects, five of the six projects actually, uh, this kind of cost recovery was not possible. Uh, because the gains again were not as uh, as anticipated, so the program did fail. Of course, there's a deeper analysis that needs to be done, but the immediate sort of thing that we saw in terms of women's labor being used towards uh, cost recovery was, in a sense, for us, a very clear sort of picture of how you know these reforms can actually impact uh, women's time and women's uh, labor and impact their health as well. Uh, now this whole thing of decentralization, again, uh, of course, <clears throat> it is uh, because of the 73rd, 74th amendments, uh, you do see that in political uh, processes, women have come out, different uh, representations for caste groups have been there. But what we found in the water sector, a couple of studies that we did, were particularly in the participatory irrigation management. Most of these systems... Uh, were the financial recovery was bad, the government was not able to actually, the irrigation department was not able to actually look into its financial health, the management was really uh, not as uh, the department would have liked to. Uh, decentralization in a sense then uh, looked much more as a sharing of burden rather than actually devolving power to the people. So whether people had a say in terms of uh, deciding on allocation of resources, in most of the places the answer was no. Hmm? So you have a clear understanding of this is your quota. 
okay in, a, in the irrigation context this is your water quota okay there was no discussion across the entire head and tail in terms of if this uh, wua has this quota uh, would it be reduced would it be increased for the other set of water users associations there was no discussions around these so allocations were clearly in the realm of what the state would decide but it was the uh, collection of costs hmm, that was what what was actually decentralized so much of the picture was that that doesn't that doesn't of course mean that people did not use these spaces wherever there were proactive groups and wherever they you know could exercise their agency people were able to use these uh, local institutions towards uh, uh, development of the water within the local context but otherwise very much uh, it was more of a sharing of burden than sharing of uh, power yeah i think joy has already discussed this a bit no in terms of caste the whole question of purity and pollution and egga ek pada utha is actually a very uh, old movement uh, in maharashtra where uh, uh, i mean although the context is of water it was actually trying to challenge the caste system and uh, what this the leadership of this movement was trying to say is that uh, you need to have one source hmm, where people across castes actually come and draw their water from so ek gaon is one village and ek panautha is one water point hmm? so the slogan was that that one village one water point so that there has to be an intermixing of caste groups people have to interact people have to come uh, discuss and debate now there were tremendous amounts of tensions this was in the 70s that this movement was at its peak and a uh, lot of tensions uh, actually did uh, come up uh, when this uh, movement uh, took off and tensions that you can very well imagine in terms of uh, a particular caste group if they actually drew water from that particular source they were actually barred from uh, being part of any activities so they were thrown out of employment they were not engaged in labor so these were the kind of implications uh, when this uh, effort was made and then in 2003 the case that he narrated was as recent as now you have uh, in the same place where ambedkar led the struggle you have uh, what is uh, a caste sort of a struggle around a water source and the solution unfortunately was diametrically opposite to what egga ek panautha was suggesting so now with our jal swaraj and swajal dhara and all of it we have this habitat based drinking water schemes right i mean all of you are aware of it that your water points are in your own habitats so in a sense it is actually separating out people across their caste location so if you are a dalit in your dalit basti we'll give you a water point don't meddle with ours you know it's a subtle way of saying that you know we don't want uh, uh, these kinds of uh, exchanges and uh, uh, intermixing of caste so it's very interesting to see how the positioning and articulation of struggles has also changed and how solutions become uh, uh, in a way you know you don't want to engage with the discourse around caste that you know let let that be let that be separated out from your uh, sort of mental engagement as a caste uh, issue yeah now i'll just stop with uh, what what is the time we need to close 6 6 time okay uh I'll just, uh, I think, just discuss this a little bit in terms of how it operates uh, in the context of gender. We've discussed a lot, actually, but uh, how how certain kinds of, uh, if you look at whether it's the Drinking Water and Sanitation Committee or the Water Users Associations, whether it is irrigation or drinking water, uh, domestic area, domestic water, uh, the understandings. dominate the programs very significantly now what are the understandings that uh, household is like a coherent cooperative unit so there are no tensions within households and that's that's one of our sort of clear mindsets when uh, government tries to approach any uh, household in a village the understanding is that the head of the household is a male so that is one clear understanding and that it's a cooperative unit there are no conflicts and tensions uh again the role of women is clearly seen in the reproductive terrain so carers nurturers uh and engaged largely in reproductive work now what happens is that this understanding is as we discussed very much part of our internalized uh, belief systems and understandings it extends in a very similar way to the water sector as well 
So you are not thinking of any new uh, arena for women at all in the water sector as well. So for example, uh, many of you have written and worked. So what you would see uh, very clearly in the water sector is that there's a clear domestic and productive water divide, right? I mean, if you're looking at the irrigation sector, you would not see so much discussion around women's participation. It's as if that is all related to commodity production and therefore a male domain. Hmm? But increasingly you see a lot of engagement of women's participation in the domestic water arena. Why? Because the domestic is a female domain. It's welfare. That's water for sanitation, cleaning, uh, drinking, washing clothes, everything that is actually part of the women's domain. So there is a crowding of those committees from 50% in Maharashtra, we are going to 75%. So you literally have, you know, um, Gram Panchayat seeking women's participation because it is believed that they are the closest to this activity. They understand that better and it's their activity. That's an expected gendered role. Hmm? So you see that there's a very clear divide in how water sector policy and discourse also operates on certain stereotypes around gender. Hmm? And a similar thing would be for caste as well where you know, they're landless, so why do you need to even bring them onto committees? So this is something that uh, you, in fact, in forest, man, uh, forest management programs also you would see that Chipko Andolan had such a tremendous uh, impact that women hugging trees. Hmm? So it was very clearly understood that women have a very close relationship with nature and that it is an inherent uh, relationship. As if uh, nothing that they perform in terms of the day-to-day -day activities has anything to do with it. So it is assumed that it's natural. It's natural that women are going to take care of their children. They're going to make sure that water is collected, whether they have to walk five miles or six miles. They will walk and bring that water because it's so close uh, an activity to them. But because they've been doing it for so long, they have the knowledge and understanding uh, which anyone else can very well have if they start doing those activities. You know? So very simply, when you plan for your water programs, there's very little sensitivity in terms of trying to reformulate gender roles and expectations. Just imagine that a woman is simply moving out of her house and she's challenging all these patriarchal contexts and is saying that I want to have a right over land, whether it's collective right, community right, individual right, and I want to plan how uh, command areas are designed, how command areas, we don't even want to envisage that. Hmm? So our policies and programs remain limited to what is her domain. Hmm? So we are still guided by those dominant understandings around water, which is what we should argue for a change in that. In fact, there was a very interesting, uh, I, whether it was an IWP, uh, port, whether it was that or I think Hindu had reported uh, something in Bundelkhand where uh, Dalit women, I think it's Parmarth group, who is working on, with Dalit women on uh, uh, basically rejuvenating tanks, but most importantly, how, why Dalits should have access to water from these tanks for both drinking water as well as irrigation uh, purposes. And some 6,000 women rallied together, all Dalit women, into collectives uh, organized by this Parmarth group and actually took charge of these tanks in that region and said that we will define what water allocation uh, has to be. So this is a very interesting kind of an example where they not only were challenging patriarchy, but they were also challenging caste, where, you know, otherwise traditionally these were in the hands of the upper caste, uh, managed by the upper caste uh, communities. So this is a very, maybe it was a very short-lived thing, but nonetheless, it made a statement in terms of what uh, can be the alternatives and what, what needs to be done in terms of challenging these uh, very firmly entrenched uh, social divisions. So the point here is that how we need to transcend some of these stereotypes, how we need to uh, really look beyond what you know the current stereotypes are and whether our pathway towards what we want to see as an alternative uh, picture in the water sector is something that is not only looking at how water in general is equitably shared, but how water uh, inequities which are cutting across social groups are also uh, challenging. I mean, basically that equity is brought in even in that context 
and that they are challenging the social structures that are actually uh, creating this kind of an inequity. So the challenge has to be not simply that, you know, the simple solutions are that uh, women's labor, women uh, walk for six miles so their backs break and uh, they have problems during pregnancy, childbirth, all of that. So, of course, therefore they need water at their doorstep. But the solution should not remain limited to just providing water at their doorstep, but also as a sensitive water advocacy group, whether we are going to say that, you know, it's not only her job, even if it's at the doorstep, it should be the men and other members of the household who should also be thinking and preoccupied with that water. It's also, you know, that mental space that needs to be freed up. I mean, imagine like I'm here, but I'm still thinking about uh, what's happening in the house. So part of my mental space is there. And if that is freed up, I'll probably do engage in much more that uh, men could engage in, for example. The same is true of caste groups where, you know, survival itself engages 80% of your mental space. What creative uh, uh, work can you engage in that remaining 10 or 20%? So these are issues that we never think are in the realm of, you know, change, whether it's in this sector or that sector. But all of it hold very serious implications on how uh, social groups can move up from where they are currently. So I think program planning needs to understand these uh, caste-based and uh, gender-based roles and how they actually are in fact strengthening the stereotypes and not really challenging them.